Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephanie Gibson, and I'm the Assistant Director for Nevada Humanities. Welcome, and thank you for joining us this afternoon for a very special conversation about the importance of civics in education and in everyday life, and the strategies and recommendations that may help our nation emerge and grow as a more robust and resilient democracy. Topics like this could not be more relevant at this moment. Um, for those of you who are less familiar with Nevada Humanities, and we have a great crowd with us this afternoon, we are Nevada's nonprofit Humanities Council and an independent partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Our mission is to connect and transform communities by sharing and amplifying the stories, ideas, experiences, and traditions of the diverse people of Nevada. We do this by producing and supporting public humanities programs around the state, just like this one. Uh, but before we begin, I do want to acknowledge that we gather in our homes throughout Nevada on the traditional lands of the Paiute, Shoshone, and Washoe people past and present, and to honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. As we move through time, our aim is to respect those before us and conserve and preserve our land for those who have yet to come. And wherever you're watching this event, you are on Indigenous land. So it's up to us to learn whose land we live on. And we have a link in the chat to help you with this. The event today is part of a season of programming from Nevada Humanities called A More Perfect Union, which is an initiative that fosters a deepening appreciation for the history of this country, our community stories, and many of our untold stories, and a commitment to understanding the founding of the United States and all of its complexities. These programs have been inspired by the state of our nation at this moment and our approach to the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence in 2026. I hope you'll join us throughout 2022 as Nevada Humanities unrolls a more perfect union initiative across the state. So it takes many people and organizations to make a program like this happen. And I would like to thank our key partners at the Humanities Center at Great Basin College in Elko for their collaboration and support, and also the National Endowment for the Humanities for their support. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. If you have questions during the event, please ask them in our chat. Um, and to begin, I'd like to introduce our moderator for our program today, who will then introduce our guest, Dr. Danielle Allen. Dr. De Dr. Deborah Modelmog is the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Professor of English at the University of Nevada, Reno. As Dean, she has implemented a number of strategic initiatives designed to confirm the value and relevance of the liberal arts across all areas of higher education. As a well-respected scholar, she has published five books and numerous articles on American literature, teaching, sexuality studies, film, and academic women's leadership. During her 30 year academic career, she has received several awards for her work on advancing diversity, equity and inclusion in higher education. Dr. Modelmog, thank you so much for being here with us today and being willing to shepherd us through the program this evening. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I really appreciate that kind introduction. Um, welcome everyone to our wonderful um, uh, conversation today with Professor Danielle Allen. Uh, Danielle Allen is a political theorist and James Bryant Conant per University Professor at Harvard University. She is also director of, of Harvard's Edmund F. Sorry, Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics. She has published broadly in democratic theory, political so sociology, and the history of political thought. She is also the principal investigator for the Democratic Knowledge Project, a distributed research and action lab at Harvard University. The Democratic Knowledge Project seeks to identify, strengthen, and disseminate the bodies of knowledge, skills, and capacities that democratic citizens need in order to succeed at operating their democracy. As co-chair of the Commission on the Practice of Democratic Citizenship, Professor Allen has engaged with communities all over the United States to explore how best to respond to the weaknesses and vulnerabilities in our political and civic life. She will talk today about our common purpose, at least I hope she will, um, which is subtitled Reinventing American Democracy for the 21st Century, which was the report that came from this work um, and that was released in June, 2020. It includes strategies and recommendations to help the nation emerge as a more resilient democracy. Um, and I hope that our conversation today will inspire you to take a look at the report. It's very interesting. And as I was mentioning to her earlier, very inspiring as well. Um, and I also want to mention that she has a brand new book out. I hope I'm right about this. I think it's been out for a week called Democracy in the Time of Coronavirus, 
Um, and so I hope you will check that out as well. So welcome, Professor Allen. Thank you so much, Dean Modelmog. It's terrific to be here with you. And please call me Danielle. And if it's OK with you, I'll call you Deborah. Is that okay. All right. All right. That sounds great. OK. OK, so I'm going to start things off with some um, sort of negative information and see if you can turn us around and, and make us very positive here. So the website of the Democratic Knowledge Project um, indicates that there are some startling statistics about how Americans feel about the US democracy and even democracy more generally. So I'm going to quote a couple of these statistics. So fewer than 30% of people under the age of 40 consider it essential to live in a democracy. And that's compared to 70% for generations before World War II. Another statistic that's startling, one in four young adults, US adults, um, sorry, believe um, that ch choosing leaders through free elections is unimportant. And then another one, only 32% of US adults feel pride in the American political system. And then when I move to the Common Purpose Report, um, one of the quotes that stands out is when American Americans are asked what unites us across our differences, the increasingly common answer is nothing. Okay, so I want to add to this. I'm, I'm trying to get as gloomy as I can here. Um, there was an article in the New York Times this week that argued that Russia's invasion of Ukraine is another sign that the world may be entering an alarming new era in which authoritarianism is on the rise. Political scientists have been warning for several years that democracy is in decline around the world. Larry Diamond of Stanford University has described the trend as a democratic recession. And Freedom House, which tracks every country in the world, reports that global political freedom has declined every year since 2006. Last year, they concluded the countries experiencing deterioration outnumbered those with improvements by the largest margin recorded since the negative trend began. Yet, your Common Pro uh, Purpose Report, which is subtitled Reinventing American Democracy for the 21st Century, insists that you and your colleagues came to believe that a reinvention of our constitutional democracy was not only necessary, but possible. So could you say more about this report and the experience and conversations that led you to this belief and that created the context for the report? Thank you so much, Deborah. I mean, that, that is a gloomy set of facts <laughs> you're kicking us off with for sure. But I do think you've captured the mood of many people. It's been a tough time these last two years and you know, obviously the pandemic, but of course the January 6th insurrection and the current invasion of Ukraine is a significant event for us. And we can't neglect the fact that Russia has proactively weakened our country by stirring up dis division here through misinformation campaigns. That effort on Russia's part is part of what now makes possible for Russia to do this. So these things really are connected. The weakening of our civic bonds um, matters a lot. Um, so yes, it is a dark and hard time um, in so many ways. The light is always from the fact that people, ordinary people um, all over the country have the capacity to link arms and find solutions. And people are doing that all over the country. So you know, our commission report was sort of an example of that. We got started on the work, I think in 2016, 2017, I can't even quite remember. And it was a matter of um, the president of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences sort of putting up a flag and saying, I'm, I'm worried. I'm really worried about what, what's happening with our democracy. And the American Academy is this organization that is older than the country. Um, it was founded by the same folks who founded the country because they believed that uh, the young um, constitutional democracy, the young republic, would always need knowledge resources to help it navigate its hardest problems. And so they set up this group that was supposed to bring in experts from across the professions together to be ready to answer those hard questions. So the Academy set up a commission. And as I said, the president of the Academy, Jonathan Fanton, put up a flag and said, you know, who else is worried? And I put up my hand and said, I'm worried. And I've been worried for a while here. All kinds of reasons. Um, could go into those at some length. But at any rate, we formed a commission um, that brought together people from all over the country, different professional sectors, different political points of view. It was really important to us to really cover the spectrum of opinion um, and different demographic backgrounds. And we worked hard you know, for a couple of years um, with listening sessions all over the country, 
trying both to understand, you know, why did people feel a sense of despair or frustration with our democracy? And then what did people see as a, a possible solutions? And you named um, the sort of irony that the thing that we share is that we feel like we don't share anything. But there's another part of that, which is as people were expressing that sense of, gosh, I'm not sure I do share things with other Americans, they were always also expressing a desire to share something. And that desire for a common purpose, for a shared endeavor was strong everywhere we went. That I think is the sort of, that's the beginning. That's the beginning of a new growth, a, of a reinvention. And we very self-consciously use the words reinvention, not renewal, not restoring and things like that, because the truth is this democracy has never been fully whole, fully healthy. And we know that because of the histories of race and racism in the country. Um, gender, domination, exclusion, and the like. And so it really is now for us, for this generation, finally to form you know, that genuinely more perfect union, um, an inclusive constitutional democracy. Um, but the appetite is there. I believe it really is across the whole country. Um, thank you so much. I'm, I'm gonna get into some of the details of why you think the um, appetite is there and what we can do about that. Um, the report has six um, strategies and then 30, 31 recommendations, so there's a lot to digest there. Um, but before we get too far into the sort of details of the report and some of the context for it, um, could you maybe just define a couple of terms that I think will be important to our conversation today? So could you say more about what you mean by democracy? And you just referred to it as a constitutional democracy. And, and one term that comes up again and again in the report is a resilient democracy. So could you say more about that term and then also citizenship? Because I think you define it slightly differently than what some people might mean by citizenship. Great, no, thanks for those questions, Deborah. And that is, it's so important because, um, you know, these are abstract words, democracy, citizenship, constitutional democracy, resilience and the like. And that I think is honestly one of the challenges of achieving reform or achieving reinvention. Um, and so in some sense, we have to sort of start by stepping back and asking at a kind of more basic level, sort of day-to-day -day level, what is it we're all sort of looking for in life anyway? What makes human beings feel like tomorrow is likely to be better than yesterday? Um, and for me, a really important part of that answer is a sense of control over one's own fate and destiny. Um, you know, we like to be empowered. It feels good to be empowered, to have control over the decisions that affect your life. And that's basically what democracy is at the end of the day, is that sense that ordinary people have of having control over their own lives and over their own fates. And that control has sort of two parts. You know, you've got the steering wheel for your own life in your own private life and the like, and we protect our privacy and our um, private rights, you know, really quite robustly because we understand the value of that. But alongside that, we actually all have to have our hands shared in a shared way on the steering wheel of our collective life. Um, of our communities, um, of our schools, you know, of our national life. Um, and so democracy is really about having that connection to, to shaping our community and a sense of empowerment that goes with that. And again, having control of your, of your, own, of your own fate. And I do believe that sort of going back to just trying to ask us to put in our, our mental space of just in our day-to-day -day life, you know, where and how do we feel a sense of empowerment, a sense of democracy, where do we feel the lack of it? I think you've got to kind of tie it back to that felt experience. And I think it's really important to say out loud, you know, lots of times in our politics, we focus on um, things that feel you know, really existential, whether it's the climate crisis or health um, resources and access to health resources um, or gun rights, the right to hunt and things like that. You know, sort of feel like they define my way of life, these issues or whether life is possible for me. And dealing with any of them though, requires that we have a healthy democracy where we can actually negotiate disputes effectively with one another. And, and have that sort of shared sense of shaping a community together. So democracy is a very abstract word, but it comes down to the nitty gritty of how we work through our disagreements in a way that leave us all feeling empowered, not disempowered. Um, so that's where that one really is. And so the resilience piece comes into that second part that I just mentioned. I sort of gave you a kind of set of issues from climate to health to gun rights and sort of spanning the political spectrum in some of those examples. Um, all of these issues present hard challenges for communities. And the resilience is about that question of like, can we actually maintain capacities to negotiate disagreements um, in ways that give us a durable shared bond with each other? Um, that is where we are really struggling right now. Um, and so it's not just a functioning democracy we want, but one that has those doors of resilience for continued wrestling and negotiation over time, but with the conviction that 
that empowerment, that experience of participation is the reward. That's why we put up with each other, okay? <laughs> Even when we disagree with each other or can't stand each other, we put up with each other because the reward is we're governing ourselves. Um, and it's getting back to a sense of the direct, you know, tangible feeling um, of the reward of self-government that I think is so critical. Yeah, and could you say just quickly something about citizenship and what uh, at least the report is um, oh, yes. uh, means by yeah. that term? Absolutely, no, thank you. So we really, um, in the report, are using the word citizenship to talk about an activity, a way of being in community. We're not using it in its legal definition. And we recognize that there are lots of debates and disputes about how to think about the legal definition of citizen. But the fact of the matter is, in every community in this country um, is made up of people, some of whom have citizenship and some of whom don't. And that might be undocumented people, but it might be people with green cards. So it has always been the case that every community in this country has always been made up of people who have a formal status of citizens and people who don't have a formal status of citizens. Yet all of them contribute to their community, um, help build its health, benefit if it's a healthy community and the like, and are part of a shared activity. So we are really focusing on that question of how does each of us in our community contribute to the development of a healthy community? Yeah, that's great. And I think um, one of the things that I'm already already hearing you talk about is the kind of local uh, civic um, engagement that we have and, and then the more national political engagement that we all participate in as well. And so yeah. I want to come back to that, but I want to um, you're already touching on it, but I think it's important for everybody here to understand sort of the historical stage for the report. And in the report, you talk about three foundings um, in the U.S., and then you uh, suggest that there is a fourth founding or the need for a fourth founding. And so I'm wondering if you could just give us that a little bit of a historical um, perspective on, you know, where we've come from and where we are now and what are the, the challenging circumstances that we face right now that require a fourth founding of our democracy? Yeah, no, thank you. So, I mean, for starters, um, again, you know, we now live in this country that's got more than 300 million people and the like, you know, we're, we're huge. And so I think a lot of times, and again, in a sort of day-to-day -day life, it can be very hard for people to have a belief that this is really a democracy, right? The sort of powers that be seem so removed, um, seem so significant and large. And so it's, I think, an important thing to bring back to everybody at a very basic level that the society we live in, the world we live in, has always been made by people. It's been made by people making decisions. And those decisions, you know, add up to a founding when they you know, taken together sort of give us a structure for our whole society. Um, and so, you know, we had a moment of founding in the 1770s at the very beginning um, at the Civil War, another very significant reorganization of who had the rights to participate. Um, the middle of the 20th century, the Civil Rights Movement gave us another incredible reorganization. Um, but, you know, in that Civil Rights Movement period, um, Dr. King said something that to me was one of the most important things said, I mean, said many of the most important things said in that period of time. Um, but one of them was in an essay called Testament of Hope. At the very end of that essay, he said, you know, the Civil Rights Act, these other pieces of legislation, they are very important. I don't want to diminish any of those achievements. But at the end of the day, we won't get where we're going until we have really reorganized the whole fabric of society. And what we need is a full sharing of power and responsibility across all of society. And I think that's the founding we're really working on now, where across all of our organizations, People from communities that have been excluded from decision making are pulled in and are participating. And that really requires, you know, adjustments to organizational practices across the board. Um, we have had historically a culture of some people having to defer to others and the like. And so to have egalitarian practices for interaction, um, for social decision making and the like is a real transition for us. So that's what the fourth founding is about. Again, it's, you know, I used the words earlier of the sort of inclusive constitutional democracy we have the chance to build now. I believe truly that our generation is uh, you know, a privileged generation, a blessed generation, because the greatest responsibility that is imaginable has been placed on our shoulders. And that is the work that I think we have to do. Um, it's, it's ours to do, it, it hasn't been done before. There is no roadmap, um, no pre-existing model to copy. We've got to figure it out. It's messy, it's hard, you know, for sure. But on the other hand, it just means we have a sort of historical responsibility to step up to. 
Yeah, and so maybe we can get into some of the details of, of how we get there, um, how we how we create this fourth founding and make this more inclusive constitutional democracy, because that is part of much of what your report is about. Um, the commission's report is trying to come up with these different strategies and then the recommendations within it that would help us restore, reinvent, you know, um, reclaim our democracy in ways that maybe we um, we haven't so far. Um, and I think, you know, the idea of a more perfect union, we've always, as you mentioned earlier, we've always been striving for a more perfect union to, to live up to the principles that were set out for us at the beginning. Um, but I want to I want to read a quote from the report on the importance of institutions of civil society in creating a more resilient democracy and then ask a question about how citizens, which we just talked about, might become more involved in the project that you laid out in this report. So here's, here's what the report says. This is a little bit of a long quote, so just bear with me. Um, but institutions of civil society together create a social infrastructure that supports a vibrant, so, sorry, supports and resilient communities. Often they are the places where Americans first develop the practical skills and habits of the heart that are fundamental to democracy. They are where citizens from all walks of life come together to attend make budget decisions and vote. And they are where these citizens can develop for diverse opinions and commit themselves to a common good. These institutions need to connect better with one another to integrate their programs more fully into their communities and to serve more effectively as bridges for people who might otherwise not otherwise find common ground. Without a set of civil society institutions that work together and build bridges across divides, no level of government intervention will be sufficient to restore cohesion to communities that are fragmented by demography, ideology, income, and suspicion. So as a, I know it's a big quote. I almost wish I could put it here up on the screen so everybody could kind of sink their teeth into it. Um, but I just want to know, um, you know, you're really talking about local institutions, you know, kind of our, our civic infrastructure that surrounds us as a place where we learn habits of heart. You talk about love in the report, which I think is a really interesting concept in a, in a political report. Um, but what are the institutions of civic society to which you are referring? And how can we become more involved in those institutions and, and sort of learn what have we lost over the years? And what do we need to learn now to get back to the kind of uh, being the kind of democratic citizen that you imagine? Yeah, no, it's a great, great question. And um, I mean, in some sense, the answer, um, you know, is in the details of the quotation that you read out that we do have a remarkable array of civil society organizations, nonprofits and the like that are pulling people into civic participation with each other. And that can reach, I always, one of my favorite examples is an organization in Lexington, Kentucky called Civic Lex which has used a combination of digital tools and in-person meeting structures to reconnect um, people in Lexington, Kentucky to decision makers. So when the county is debating something about the water infrastructure, they're not doing that in a vacuum without citizen awareness or citizen understanding, but they've been reconnected to that. Um, it can be um, you know, faith-based organizing groups that build networks across churches and ask, those churches to think not just about what does their church community need to thrive, but what does a larger set of communities need to thrive and how can they work on that together. Um, there are just examples all over the country. And I think the real challenge is that I think a lot of us have ceased to believe that participating in this way helps us put our hands on the steering wheel of our collective life. And so that is, I think, the message our report is trying to, to share, which is that actually these organizations are contributing to the steering wheel um, of our collective life and, and are actually sort of shaping its direction and force. Not, you know, all together. And we watch our national politics. We watch the operations of the parties and so forth. The political parties are those biggest, most powerful associations at the end of the day. Um, but so if we want ordinary people to get back to a place where they really do have full power, We've got to build up that associational life uh, to a stronger level uh, so that it you know, can play a role and that we are not just leaving it to the parties to do this work of really defining what the kind of key debates are in our democracy. I can't, um, I, I told um, uh, Stephanie that I wouldn't focus only on formal education, but I want to, I'm a, a dean of a college of liberal arts and so 
I want to say or, or ask you a few questions about our educational system because um, it's repeatedly the report talks about the, the loss of civic education and how we used to have many more opportunities to gain sort of a formal uh, civic understanding and, and to engage in civic um, uh, responsibilities. Um, so what do you see as the role of public education, you know, all the way from K through 12 into the university in sort of helping the citizens, uh, citizens become more engaged in their civic life? But, you know, I think this is a really big and deep question, and I think it honestly goes to the heart of the challenges we face right now. Um, you know, we had this thing happen in the middle of the 20th century that really reoriented our educational system. Um, the thing that happened was World War II, not a small thing by any stretch of the imagination. But one of the outcomes of World War II was, um, as we all know, as a country, we raced so hard to compete with Germany. Uh, to build an atom bomb before Germany did, right? That was decisive to winning the war. And the way we went about doing that was under the leadership of, of the then president of Harvard, James Bryan Conant, whose name is on my professorship, um, the country pulled together the Manhattan Project. This was a massive investment, federal investment in a network of research universities to accelerate the pace of work needed to achieve the atom bomb. And basically, um, that was the beginning of the real investment by the federal government in science education, first research science and then science education. And that period was followed by the launch of the Sputnik satellite by the Soviet Union in the 50s. That gave the country the sense that we were falling behind in a global competition around science and technology. And so under Eisenhower, educational policy really redoubled efforts to invest in STEM education. And that was repeated in the 80s when we had a sense of our falling behind in an economic competition with Japan. And the result of that now is that we are at a point where in this country, um, on an annual basis, we invest about $50 per kid in STEM education and five cents per kid in civics education. All righty. So I always say you get what you pay for. <laughs> and so there you have it. You know, we are a tech savvy society that has no idea how to do citizenship any longer. And so what has lost out in that? The liberal arts, for sure. I mean, the core of a civic education is an education in history, in literature and rhetoric, because you've got to be able to make a compelling case to your fellow citizens. You've got to be able to express what matters to you and why with clarity and force. Um, it's about sociology and political science, understanding the economy. Um, this is the core content of the liberal arts. It's the core content of citizenship. And you know, it's always another sort of paradox of democracy is that of all the possible types of political system or on the face of the earth, it's democracy that needs the most leaders, <laughs> right? It's democracy. I mean, the whole point of an autocracy is that one person's enough to do the job or one person and a few minions are enough to do the job. But in a democracy, you need leaders everywhere. You know, we run everything with committees and we have boards and commissions all over the place. Um, and the leadership education is a liberal arts education. It just is. Um, science and technology help us learn how to do the things we want to do. But in terms of knowing what we want to do, what our goals and purposes are, our human purposes, and why those things matter, that's the liberal arts. So we really have um, handicapped ourselves, I would say. Um, we have undermined ourselves by not investing in the education of democratic leadership. Um, so, you know, day after day, you know, I'm always grateful to people like you, Deborah, who are working so hard to make the case for a reinvestment in that democratic leadership. Well, I, I'm so glad this is being recorded and I'm gonna ask you if I can post this on our website <laughs> because you just made a brilliant um, uh, justification for the liberal arts. And um, I agree with you, I think we need, um, more of this type of education rather than less. Um, we have people who don't even understand our political system or that we have three branches of government um, who don't understand our, our history or what we can learn from it. Um, and so it's really important that all of us become better engaged and more engaged in these ways. Um, so what happens though, you know, if you are you know, somebody um, who doesn't have access to a formal education or you're, you're out of school and you know, you're working in, in the world now, um, but you really want to kind of, um, you know, reinvest in the civic society that you're talking about, you know, where are the opportunities for that? Yeah, no, I think that's a really important point. And it's, it's so, you know, it's critical to underscore that a formal education is in no means, is by no means necessary for a civic education. And I 
I always love to point to Abraham Lincoln, who basically had no formal education. He was a fully self-educated individual. Um, so formal education is not necessary. Um, however, if we provide a formal education to people, it should absolutely include a civic education and the liberal arts. Um, but so, you know, this comes back again to the sorts of examples of the ways in which people are, are looking at the problem and solving the problem. There's a wonderful young man um, here in the Boston area, Jaron Chang is his name, who runs a program called Gen Unity, which um, when he first conceived of it, what he imagined was a sort of gym membership um, for civic participation for millennials, you know, sort of thinking of himself and his cohort. And what it has grown into is a kind of cohort-based model where um, employers are sponsoring um, employees to have some extra time to go ahead and learn more about their civic selves, form a civic identity, identify which parts of their community they want to participate in, in civically. And I think this is brilliant. I think it's a great idea, a way to make space in the working world um, for civic participation. We are all used to our employers, for example, um, inviting people to participate in the United Way campaigns. So you can think of this as a kind of turn the dial a little bit. You know, charity is good. It's good that we all um, contribute to our communities through charitable actions, but let's go ahead and ask employers to make space to support civic participation too. Um, that's just as important and it's not the same thing. You know, we have to make that distinction. So. Yeah, that's that's really great. And um, I, I think I'll, with, with this moment, I'll come back to um, some of the strategies that you all talk about. Um, that, that to me, um, overcoming some of the, the obstacles to this type of education and to a resilient democracy seem huge. Um, and so one of the strategies that I focused on, and again, this might be because of, of my background, but I think it's one that we all are concerned about these days, um, is the media um, and, and social media and the ways in which um, some media structures um, kind of dictate what we are able to what we see you know when we're on the screen what we go when we go on to facebook or or instagram or um twitter you know what kinds of things we're fed um and so getting out of that sort of loop of being in a particular uh way of looking at things becomes very hard and you sort of get sucked into you know one thing after another that that sort of reinforces a particular way of looking at things so i get very very um uh, sort of discouraged when I think about the way in which the media sort of manipulates our emotions and even our thinking. And so I wonder if you could say more about how we get out of that type of system or what kinds of recommendations you all have for uh, moving us past a, a sort of media loop that we all seem to be sucked into. So no, I mean, that's definitely one of the hardest things there is. Um, and, you know, I think whether it's where we all start screaming at the television because we're tired of the sort of just constant outrage um, setting that it's set on, um, or whether it's because we find ourselves in a conversation with somebody we kind of can't believe the things they believe and we're trying to figure out how on earth did you come to think that that was a fact and so forth. You know, we just encounter these frustrations um, left and right. And it's hard because you, for a healthy democracy, you do need a healthy media ecosystem. And here it's a mix of strategies. And in our report, we recommend a mix of strategies. There are those sorts of things that um, local organizations can do to rebuild a healthy media ecosystem. There are good examples of um, sort of alternative social media networks that are homegrown um, that bring in participation rules right from the get-go um, that help people maintain um, decency and you know just kind of kindness to each other, anti-bullying behavior and the like. Um, they can grow those networks even to the level of a whole state. I think it's um, Vermont that has one called um, Front Porch or something like that, which um, has that um, those qualities to it. Um, but then we also do need policy levers to pull. So for example, I think that we ought to be ta uh, taxing um, the targeted ad revenue that social media companies earn um, and investing that tax revenue in rebuilding local journalism. Um, a lot of people are sort of pulled into the really quite toxic sort of national media ecosystem or the social media ecosystem because at this point of vacuums of information that come from a more local, more grounded um, point of view. Um, so I think for me, that's one of the most important sort of big picture policy um, actions that we could take. 
Um, but it's really important always that these things go hand in glove together. You know, it's not like all the answers are big picture policy ones or all the answers are kind of local grassroots things. We really do have to be working on all levels simultaneously. And so I will just share that for the Our Common Purpose Report, and you, you might ask a question about this later, but um, one of the, the most exciting things about it is not just the sort of specific sets of reforms recommendations in the report, but the fact that the report has generated a national network of champions, um, organizations of all scales who are moving these reforms forward. Before we did the work of the report, many of these already existed in various sort of isolated and fragmented ways. They didn't know each other. And so what we have done is create a field of shared endeavor. That's that, per that our common purpose idea again. Um, and it has been something that, you know, some people have an appetite for something to share. You know, I think this kind of roadmap, this project is giving people something to work on together. Um, and that's what it will really take is just, you know, all hands on deck, people at all different levels from the grassroots to the big picture policy pieces. Um, but if we're working towards the sort of same destination, uh, we'll get there. You know, it'll take a whole chunk of time for sure. But if we're all working in our different lanes on the different parts of this, we're going to turn the dial and we will deliver ourselves to a new situation. Yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 you're, you're back to the optimism again, and I, I, <laughs> I just love your idealism. Um, and I always, I always joke with people that on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm really optimistic, and Tuesday and Thursday, I'm pessimistic. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then the weekends I rest. Um, but uh, <laughs> well, good. I I'm think, glad you rest. <laughs> I think one of the things that also gives me um, concern is is the way in which um, you know money and and political funding um, has such a big seems to have such a big impact on who's elected and you know how we how we see things in our society and and so I wonder what what you think can be done about that. Um, about the, the powerful interests that seem to control what we're able to see and who we're able to vote for. Yeah, I mean, again, this is a place where, you know, I think a lot of people can just feel sort of paralyzed. We look at our politics and it all just feels so big. And again, so removed, so much money. How can I make any kind of difference? And for me, I think it's really important to step back and to recognize that at the level of every state, um, we have actually a much more direct path towards influence um, and impact. And I do believe, you know, at the end of the day, we are a country made out of states. And, you know, even our federal government, you know, it, it changes, it bends, it's, its shape reflects what's happening in the states. So I think starting with that, like remembering that point is really important. And if we do that, we can look around the states and we can see some actually really good um, experiments, some examples. Connecticut, for example, um, does public financing for state uh, level campaigns. Um, at a reasonable level, people can actually run campaigns that permits them to um, really fully communicate with the public in Connecticut. And it has opened up the field of participants, you know, more diverse sets of people running for office. And they don't actually have that much outside expenditure in their elections in Connecticut. So the good news is you know, we can find places where people are experimenting their way to solutions. And we have to lift those up um, and really you know, help others see what the path is to those solutions. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for that example. Um, I used to live in Connecticut, and I'm not surprised that they've done something like that. Uh, we had a lot of civic engagement there. Um, we, we often had um, like just local meetings where we would talk about who we were going to elect to office. And it was it was like being in the old days when you could actually make a difference with, with who you elected. Um, so I want to, we're kind of coming near to the point where I'd like to let some of the um, audience questions be asked. Um, but I'd like to just kind of, you hinted at this, but I, I want to go back to, um, you know, kind of the conclusion of the report. And you, you are argued that you were going, or you, achieve, you aspired to achieve significant progress on all recommendations by 2026, the 20, 250th anniversary of the nation's birth. And so, and then in the middle of the report, while you were working on it, COVID happened. Uh, the report was written before there were the, were the, the major calls for um, racial justice. Um, and so a lot of things have happened since the report was actually formulated. And so I just want to ask you, and you, you kind of hinted at this with all the people who are signing on to, to be committed to the report, but just ask you, are you still as hopeful as you were when you started this project? And do, do you, is there anything in the report that now you would like to rethink and, and or add to the report or take out of the report that you feel differently about at this point, kind of two years later after, after the report was um, finalized? Yeah, no, I mean, it's a great question. And um, 
So do I think we all feel great about the report? We feel terrific about the way the work is moving forward, for sure. And that big national network of champions is really where the excitement um, lies. Um, I think, you know, in the report, there is a mix of recommendations that are at the federal level versus at the state level versus at the local level. And I suppose we would probably say we feel somewhat less optimistic uh, now, two years on, about the accomplishment of the, the ones that were federal um, specifically, um, but more optimistic about the ones that were state and local, which we I think we are seeing real forward movement. And not, um, not without optimism still for some of the federal pieces, there, there is movement um, on some aspects of them. So uh, that would be a sort of a broad brush picture. I, mean, I would say there were two themes that came up in our discussions toward the end where we thought we hadn't really done justice to them. Um, and one was issues of economic strain for people around the country and how that relates to political participation. And then the other is the issue of the political parties and the role they play. So with regard to economic strain, just to make it very concrete, you know, in the course of doing listening sessions of a variety of kinds over the last few years, um, you know, I have heard a lot of, for example, from young people who say, you know, I, I encountering this work has made me stop and wonder why I'm not civically engaged. And I've realized that I'm not civically engaged because I'm rent burdened. And so I know I'm not actually going to stay in this community that I'm in right now. I'm going to move soon. So what's the point of actually getting involved? And, you know, we, we forget actually that, you know, if your economy demands too much of people um, from the point of view of, you know, what it takes for people to put kind of just body and soul together in terms of being food on the table, stable housing and stuff like that, you will harm civic participation. So I do think we have to give some thought to how do we have an economy that gives people the time and stability they need for civic participation. So that's one piece I think that we probably didn't spend enough time thinking about. Um, and then the other piece is, again, the, you know, the political parties, we were talking about how we need to rebuild a network of civic um, organizations around the country, and we do. Um, the parties are civic organizations and associations. They have a huge amount of power. Um, and until we actually really sort of reckon with uh, the role they are playing in our democracy, I don't think we'll have a full picture of what we need to do. And that was a piece we came to at the end, thought it was too big for us to bite off and chew on towards the end of the work, sort of left it for another day, but it's probably, you know, volume two or something like that. It's, it's probably a place that some, um, you know, thought needs to be applied. Has, has there been any response from either political party about the report, any formal response? Um, well, not from the parties as such, but certainly from elected officials in both parties. So we have across all the work always worked to the utmost to make sure we were building bipartisan coalitions. So we do have supporters for the reform efforts um, from both parties, you know, in both houses of Congress, from elected officials around the country and the like. Um, we have not directly addressed the question of, you know, the role of parties as civic associations um, in the structure of our democracy. So I'm going to ask you some questions from our audience, um, and they're going to be a lot tougher than I am, so get ready. Sure. <laughs> um, so the first one is, um, uh, this is from a student here at, at UNR um, who is currently studying international relations and political science and economic policy. Um, and this student wants to know, to what degree, if any, do you feel that a reimagining of our free market capitalist economic structure is necessary to create this more perfect union? And what might this reimagined structure look like? Well, you'll be happy to hear that some colleagues and I have a volume coming out from the University of Chicago Press in September called A Political Economy of Justice. Um, and it's an answer to that question. Um, it is an argument about an economy that would support constitutional democracy. Um, it's a, the, across the essays, there's a whole lot of reimagining. In general, all the essays um, are supportive of market operations um, as well as of public sector tools. Um, market operations is a separate um, category from capitalism as such. Um, and we all recognize that you know, markets are structured in a variety of different ways and questions sort of what kind of market economy um, should we have? Um, and then there's debate in the volume about that question. Um, so the short answer is yes, we have a lot of work to do on our economy. Um, and I think there's a lot we could do to improve it and make sure that it's operating in ways that do support um, citizens, support empowerment, support constitutional democracy. Um, and so I'm sorry to give you the shorthand of saying, uh, check back in September, but you know, if you don't mind, there's, there's a book 
to be had. It's called A Political Economy of Justice, coming out from the University of Chicago Press in September, and is a direct answer to the question that was just posed. I, I think I, I see um, a, a, an invitation to have you come back and, uh, <laughs> and speak to us about your new book. Um, well, so a long list of great contributors in the book, so you should take a look at the table of contents, and any of those folks would be fantastic to have, and it would be a great conversation, so I would encourage yeah. you to Yeah, maybe we need to have a panel, that. yeah. Um, so um, I have a question from a library student. Um, what role can libraries play in encouraging civic engagement, and how early, ages three to five story times, should students start learning about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? Um, well, first of all, thank you. I always love a question from a librarian. My mom's a librarian, so and I always, you know, I am afraid that's my, my mother's disappointment in me that I did not myself become a librarian. So I'm always, it's an honor to get a question from a librarian. Librarians have a huge role to play. You know, librarians are still among the most trusted um, institutions, organizations in our society. We have seen such declines in trust for universities, um, for other leading institutions, but libraries, libraries and librarians continue to have that trust um, of, of people generally. And of course, librarians and libraries do the work of curating information and helping people know how to navigate our information ecosystem. So from my point of view, there's literally no profession that's more important right now for giving us a fresh and stable anchor for civic engagement. Um, and so there's lots of good work to do. I could refer you to our Massachusetts Consortium of Libraries that are doing work around civic engagement or others. Um, happy to have reach outs and make direct uh, connections and links if that's of interest. Um, but then with regard to the question of when is it, you know, what, what's the age to start learning about something like Martin Luther King? Um, you've got to remember every black kid in America is learning about Dr. King from before, you know, mother's milk, basically. So there is no time that's too early. Um, the only question is how you do it. and um, you know, it's a matter of always making sure that we are letting um, stories be told through the voices of the people who experience them, for starters. So use Dr. King's words, you know, introduce young people to Dr. King's words. And also that the stories are always stories of agency and hope. Um, this country does have a lot of bad history, dark history, but it's also history that people overcome. And so I think making sure that we learn how to tell our stories so that what we do is bring to the fore how people were agents. What were their sources of hope? What gave them the ability to be resilient, to overcome challenge and difficulty? What gifts did they give? And why did they think it was worth it in the first place? Dr. King believed in this country despite all of its difficulties and injustices, yet he believed. Why? Why? We've got to answer that question. And I think if we start there, it um, doesn't matter how young kids are to be engaged uh, in the truth um, about our country. So, um, I actually know some of the people who are asking questions, so um, I, I know a little bit about where they're coming from. Um, but I want to, uh, this is a question I, I think that um, really resonates when you think about the civic engagement that's happening at the local level. Um, many of our, and we talked about this before we started the um, session today, but many of our um, local groups are sort of being infiltrated by um, sometimes outsiders, sometimes extremists who will sort of burst into public meetings or into school board meetings um, and try to make democratic decision-making very difficult. So what do you think we can do to deal with this situation? Well, there's a lot. I mean, this is a really hard problem. Um, and so what I can do is just share some thoughts, um, not answers, because it's a problem we have to all work our way through together. Um, but just a little bit of context for the problem. We do have a problem. Um, right now in this country of extremism of various kinds. Um, but we have to also understand it's not entirely homegrown already. Um, and this could be a hard thing for us to stay clear about, but I'll just give you a very concrete example. Um, I was a long time columnist for the Washington Post. And in the fall of 2015 through 2016, I spent a lot of time writing critically about Donald Trump. I was very opposed to his election. I was one of the earliest voices writing in opposition to his election. And I got a slew of hate communication, hate mail, hate phone calls and voicemails, hate tweets and things like that. And, you know, pictures of nooses and pictures of gas ovens and just, you know, the whole kit and caboodle. And it was having an effect on me. It was having a psychological effect on me. It was, you know, making it such that I like, didn't like going outside and like walking around my world. It was like, who out there exactly is it? Who hates me? You know, what, who are these people? And so there's a point that came that I asked a colleague who with significant sort of tech experience to um, 
try to map for me where this stuff was coming from? And he found to our surprise that a lot of it was coming from Eastern Europe, all right? Um, and this was before, you know, any of the sort of the national studies were done that showed the sort of Russian misinformation working in the campaign. Um, but it was stuff that was being presented as if it was American, but it was literally coming from outside. And so we have literally been subject over the last period of time to the work of what is a global network um, of right-wing extremists who, among other things, like recruit people in our country to participate in that, stir the pot, stir up trouble and the like. So that is a part of what's happening. I'm not saying it's all of what's happening, but we have to be honest about it. And so then the question is always, you know, well, how do we uh, rebuild bonds of solidarity to protect ourselves from that kind of pot stirring um, behavior and activity? And I think that there are both tools that you can use in decision-making, um, literally sort of how do you structure meetings, how do you organize agendas and things like that, that actually can help reset relations among people who've been agitated by this kind of pot stirring. And I would recommend the work of James Fishkin at Stanford. He has a set of techniques that are called deliberative democracy techniques that are depolarizing. Um, and there's a lot of work on how you depolarize communities that have become polarized. So James Fishkin at Stanford, I think is a critical resource. Um, and then as a matter of our own personal habits, I think we have to all work really hard to call people in to shared work as opposed to calling people out. Um, so in a polarized context, it can be very easy to fall into a finger pointing, blaming game. Um, but the truth of the matter is that most people actually have their hearts in the right place. And there's lots of evidence for that, which if you want me to enumerate, I can. But, uh, but you know, we've got to call in, not call out. And I think build a culture around calling in to shared purpose, uh, not calling out. And, and that honestly is not just what we need to make life better in our own communities, but it's like what we need to deal with Russia invading Ukraine. Okay, if these things are actually connected to each other. Uh, thank you, and, and I'm so sorry to hear about your experience. Um, I, I know many people today who are having a similar experience and it's very discouraging. Um, so I wanna um, pose a question to you that a high school student here in Reno is asking. Uh, this high school student says, I often feel helpless when it comes to civic engagement because it feels like you can't make real change until you're old enough for someone to listen to you. What advice would you give to me and others my age who are strugg struggling to feel civically engaged? So I so appreciate that question. That is such a beautiful question. And it is hard if you're not 18 yet, you don't have the right to vote yet, you can't run for office yet, hard to feel as if you can have your hands on the steering wheel. And I think what's so important is your voice. Your voice is just, it's gold. It's a treasure. And we who are older need to hear your voice. In my own experience, in my of course, in my own life, it's always been younger people who blew the whistle sooner on things that were a problem um, in our communities. That was true for the growth of mass incarceration. Young people were blowing the whistle on that well before older people were, were noticing. It's true for climate. Young people have been blowing the whistle. Um, so we need your voice. And so what I would start would be to just advise you, um, work on strengthening your voice and learning about all the places that you can put your voice into the mix. Um, make sure that people are hearing your voice. Ask them to say back to you, what have they heard from you? Um, and if you can do that work of asking people to say back, what, what have you heard me say? Um, and if you can start getting people to say they're hearing you, you're making a difference. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I agree with you that young people are showing us the way, way to the future um, and they need to use their voices to make sure that we hear them. Um, so here's, here's gonna be a, one that's a little bit tougher and I, I know the person who is asking this who is just a wonderful, amazing person, um, but just hang, hang in there with me. Um, to what degree must we engage in structural reform to modify or abolish the counter-majoritarian institutions that have slowed or stemmed the implementation of small d democratic or progressive policies like voting rights protections, stricter gun regulations and campaign finance reform. I am thinking, this is the, the person speaking, I am thinking of institutions like the Electoral College, the US Senate itself and the filibuster. Yeah, no, I appreciate the question. And we certainly do have a lot of counter majoritarian measures um, in our political institutions. That said, we want some counter-majoritarian measures, right? Because a healthy democracy also depends on protecting minorities. Um, so a healthy democracy is always a blend 
of the right kind of majoritarian measures and the right kinds of counter majoritarian measures. So the question, the goal is not to eradicate all counter majoritarian measures. You know, the sort of 14th Amendment equal protection of the laws is a counter majoritarian measure that's just fundamentally important, for instance. Um, so the question is, which are the ones we need? Which are the ones that should change? I have, as it happens, different answers for each of the specific ones that you mentioned. So filibuster, I say, get rid of it. It should be gone. It is hindering the legislature from doing its job, which is legislating. And we actually need dynamism um, in our legislature in order to have a healthy democracy. So filibuster, I'm for scrapping it. Senate and the Electoral College, I have a different take on. Um, I think we need reform, but the reform I support that would address the imbalances that have accrued in those institutions um, is to increase the size of Congress, the House of Representatives, that is. Um, so if you look at our, our Common Purpose report, um, we recommend um, getting rid of the arbitrarily set cap on the size of the House. It was set in the early 20th century. It had originally been intended to always grow. At this point, the British Parliament and the German you know, Parliament are both significantly larger than the US House of Representatives. Um, so there's a heck of a lot of room to go up um, and have a functional um, lower house. That would rebalance the Electoral College, actually, and it would change the way this, you know, the operations of the Senate, too, in some important ways. So that is the particular reform uh, that I think we need, um, but I would more broadly say that the question is, what's the right kind of combination of majoritarian and counter-majoritarian um, mechanisms so that we have a kind of equilibrated um, system that's empowering everybody, including minorities? of all kinds, including rural mi minorities, for example. So fantastic. And I think we're getting near the end of our time because I can see Stephanie on the screen. Um, I just <laughs> want to say before Stephanie kind of um, uh, takes us um, out, of the, out of the session today, um, that one of the things your, your strategy six is to inspire a culture of commitment to American constitutional democracy and one another. And I know that you see all of these strategies as inter intersection, intersecting, and I think that's really wonderful. Um, but I just wanna say that I see this report as part of that inspiration. So just thank you all for, for all the time that you took putting this report together, making us think really deeply about our commitment to our democracy and to one another and, and giving us some ideas about how to move this forward. So thank you, Danielle, for, for what you've done for us. Oh, thank you. It was a pleasure. It was a big team. It was a big team. You know, there were three of us co-chairs, 30 of us on the commission and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people around the country who participated in our listening sessions and deliberative engagements and things like that. So and now, you know, thousands participating and trying to move the work forward. So uh, so I'll just say thanks for all of us. <laughs> well, I want to echo that. Thanks. And um, I think um, your call to rebuild bonds of solidarity is something we'll all take with us, um, Danielle. So thank you so very much for sharing such wise knowledge and advice for us. Um, we'll put the link to the Our, Our Common Purpose report. Um, when you say it's, when you call it a report, it sounds so serious, but it's really readable for high school students all the way up to to lifelong learners. Um, I really highly recommend it. And please keep in touch with Nevada Humanities. Um, we'll be doing more work around this report and speaking to, to some more of your colleagues over the next year. Um, uh, just a huge warm thank you to Dr. Danielle Allen and Dr. Deborah Modelmog for being here uh, this afternoon. And a quick reminder, you can find Dr. Allen's books for sale at our local Nevada independent bookstores, Sundance Books and Music in Reno and the Writer's Block in Las Vegas. And both bookstores have online sales available as well. And, and please visit us at nevadahumanities.org so you can learn more about what we're up to this year. And I just want to thank you all again and uh, thank you for joining us and, and everybody stay sa uh, safe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great to be with you. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.